Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, also a production of the Noon Institute. Of course, today is August 8th, 2021. I actually rarely ever speak about what the date is, but this time we're going to make sure we do it. On your screen, Daniel 9, the Messiah the Prince, the famed 70 weeks timeline that so many of us refer to um, and have believed that this is a prophecy yet to be fulfilled, or at least in part, Daniel's uh, chapter 9 has partially not been fulfilled. And those of you that have followed our ministry for years know that I also taught this and, uh, and only have discovered in the last couple of years that many of those prophecies, whether it be Obadiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, so many of these prophecies actually had been fulfilled. And no, I'm not a preterist. Uh, I know they have their own doctrine on things. People actually asked that in the beginning. I didn't even know about this group or what they believed. Uh, mine was more inspired from a sister, uh, Sister Jennifer, that uh, told my wife one day, have Brother Steve read the prophecy, talking about the ten men will take a hold of him that is a Jew, take a hold of, uh, of, of his hem of his garment, have him read that in the Hebrew language. Uh, him that is a Jew is a singular and it was true. It was a singular. Um, they would take a hold of a ish Yehudi, a Jewish man. Uh, the only part that's plural is when it says, and we will go with you for we hear God is with you. Acts chapter 2, fulfillment. Uh, the you, the plural of you, was those that had believed on Jesus Christ. That was where that fulfillment had come in. So at any rate, I began to study more deeply, more intently, all the different prophecies that had been futurized only uh, to my own dismay and repented heart. I had realized I had taught so much of this in error. And uh, this is what has also helped contribute to Israel, the modern state of Israel, that is, and the Orthodox Jewish community uh, to be lifted up as great uh, the great thing that God is doing in this day, having no clue that many of these prophecies were already fulfilled. And I'm going to be talking to you, and I know many people probably already have the brakes on. Oh my gosh, don't listen, Steve. Oh, I can't believe you're saying this. Well, I'm going to take you even through the Damascus document right here, okay, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'm going to show you exactly the fulfillment of this prophecy. You're going to be amazed in a way that you've probably never heard Daniel spoken of about before. And I'm amazed as I prepared this study for you guys, I'm amazed myself that this is something that the Qumran community knew that the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy would be at the advent of the Messiah. And what would happen? Uh, Jeremiah knew it. In fact, Daniel, when Daniel actually um, is beginning his teaching on this, Daniel refers to Jeremiah. Let me, let's take you back up to the beginning up here of Daniel chapter 9. And let's look at just that portion of this alone. Right, Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, meditated in the books over the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish for the desolations of Jerusalem 70 years. Now, as you hear that, as you read it for yourself, as you see it for yourself, one thing I want you to remember is that the destruction of the second temple happened in what? 70 A.D. 70 A.D. From the birth of Jesus Christ to the destruction of the second temple was 70 years. And Daniel is meditating in the books over the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish for the desolation of, the, of Jerusalem 70 years. 
not just not just the temple, but Jerusalem as well, the city, everything. Now think about this for a moment. Because when Nebuchadnezzar came and took the children of Israel into captivity back during Jeremiah's day, how many of you actually know that historically they were there longer than 70 years? Yeah. And not only that, when they do come back under Darius, Cyrus, and Artaxerxes, uh, the different kings that had given the order to command to go and rebuild, actually it's Artaxerxes that give the command to go back and restore and build the city of Jerusalem once again, right? And when he gives that decree, uh, the temple is still there. It just has to be restored. The walls to protect the city have to be restored. There is no total desolation under Nebuchadnezzar. And when we look at what Daniel is going to say, we find out when we get down here about the... Um, the, the fame part of the, the scriptures, verses 23 to 27, says, at the beginning of thy supplications, let me, let me back up to verse 22. And he made, made me to understand, and I talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to make thee skillful of understanding. This is Gabriel. Gabriel the angel has come to Daniel. At the beginning of thy supplications, a word went forth, and I, came, I come to declare it, for you are greatly beloved, therefore look into the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to forgive iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal the vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. Know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem until one anointed a prince shall be seven weeks and four, three score and two weeks. And it should be built again with a broad place and a moat in troublous times. And after the three score and two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off and be no more. And the people of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. But his end shall be with a flood and to the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall make a firm covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. And upon the wing of detestable things shall be that which causeth the palmet. And that until the extermination wholly determined be poured out upon that which causeth a palmet. Okay? That's what many people look at. That's what we focus on. And because of the way it's worded here, it has been divided up into two different time frames. Again, I also taught the exact same thing. That's where we get that famed biblical picture of the timeline. Uh, never mind, you know, the destruction of the of the temple and the city of 70 AD, which would seem to have some correlation of biblical prophecy being fulfilled. No, we don't look at that. We just simply break it up. And why do we break it up? Well. My wife had sent me a uh, historical documentation about that. And basically, where did this doctrine begin? Because it wasn't in the church whatsoever. It had never been taught two-part dispensationalism. It had not been taught. That was something that was made famed by uh, John Nelson Darby and, of course, Schofield. And we're looking back in the 1800s. Uh, around 1830 or so, there was a, uh, a young woman who lived in Scotland by the name of Margaret MacDonald. And at a prayer meeting, uh, she had a vision of rapture, dispen uh, dispensationalism, where were to become intimately connected in the erroneous and, and, and a novel teaching, unknown the history of, to the history of Christianity in the first place. But they took this and they began to build this doctrine. And why did this doctrine need to be built in order for Satan, who wanted to be sitting in the temple of God, to be worshipped as if he were God, he would need to have some way to create the state of Israel once again. And whether or not they ever build the third temple would make no difference. Because Satan is not interested, when he says he wants to be like the Most High, 
worship like the Most High, sitting in the temple of God as if he were showing in himself that he is God. Um, this is a prophecy, or this is Satan's desire, and it is something that he will manage to do with modern day AI technology. And Satan will be successful in getting control of the people getting control of their minds, being within them through artificial intelligence. Uh, I've even wondered as they talk about this new tech, or this, this technology that they said that was placed in the vaccine, kind of reminds you of black goo. I saw where they were showing where some of this, this black substance had been taken out of an individual that allegedly had been vaccinated and this alleged, infer this alleged substance like had a life of its own. Reminded me of what Harold Kalsvilla once told me uh, when we were in Europe. We were sitting in my office and we were talking about black goo and he said it's a living um, alien type of entity. It is uh, what is used in Mecca under the um, under that cube that they have in Mecca. The very same substance they want to move, uh, supposedly from an asteroid, to be moved to Israel to be placed in the third temple. It is also, from what I was told by Harold, it was uh, this black goo is found under many altars in Catholic churches throughout Europe. Satan, though, would like that substance to be within the human genome so that he can be as if he were God, sitting in the temple of God, the human body, which actually the true temple is your soul. It is you are that temple, but it's 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 the Holy Spirit within you, within your own soul, that quickens you and makes you one with Christ. And Satan can never do that. He can only mimic what God has already done. So he had to create, Satan had to create a false doctrine to get people away from almost 2,000 years of biblical truth and to get you to believe this perpetrated lie that certain scriptures have never been fulfilled and they're going to be fulfilled in modern days. Now, I'm going to shock you with the Damascus document because the Damascus document written by early Israelites 2,000 years ago is also going to clear up this matter for you. That's why I say, please bear with me. If you ever bared with me on any teaching, bear with me on this one here. Now, I want to back you up a little bit, though, here. Let's go back in Daniel. There's something very interesting here in verse 23, and I highlighted both the Hebrew and the English. So let's read verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, a word went forth, and I am come to declare it, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, look into the word. Kimadot ata. Excuse me. Look into the word and understand the vision. Uvein bedavar uvein bemera. What does that mean? That uvein uvein is literally. In fact, this is actually Joshua's name. The spelling of his name when it says Joshua, the son of Nun, Joshua bin Nun. Joshua Ben-Nun is not spelled in the Hebrew as Ben-Nun, like a son of Nun, but he is, he is Joshua Ben-Nun, which is Joshua, the divine understanding of Nun. That could be taken in such a depth that, <laughs> My mind is already racing with it, right? Because Nun is also believed to be the representation of serpent, is one thought there. Uh, like the final Nun is kind of like a cobra up on its on its head there. So what is it? It is. It's, it's not the meaning of the of the letter or the name Nun. It's just the it's the letter itself is depicted uh, like that. So what is it? It is a divine understanding or the knowing of the true reptilian agenda. It's one way you could look at that. Also, the word being is the word between. It can be 
uh, defined as, because you have to remember there, there are antonyms, synonyms in, in Hebrew, words that are, I forget how that works in English, but you know, like words that are spelled the same, but have different meanings. So besides the divine understanding, it means between. Now, between and divine understanding kind of go hand in hand because it's like reading between the lines. It's knowing what's hidden in the text. So the angel tells him, therefore, look into the word and understand the vision. Literally says, and divinely in the word and in between see what's written there or see the vision. This is what you're looking at. This is what we're reading there. So 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to forgive iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. Jesus Christ fulfills all of verse 24. He finished the transgression. He made an end of sin. He forgave iniquity. He brought in everlasting righteousness. He sealed the vision of the prophet. All the visions of the prophet were fulfilled in him. And the anointed, the most holy place, which we could look at that in two different ways. We could say that he himself was anointed, but he, as being the anointed one, anointed the holy place, which you are that place, you are the, because it actually uses right here, Kodesh Kodeshim. That was the, Kodesh Kodeshim was always the, the uh, inside the veil. It was the Holy of Holies. You are the temple of God. And inside of you is the Holy of Holies. And in, in order for the Holy of Holies to be anointed, it takes the, Holy Spirit, it takes the Spirit, the very life of Jesus Christ, to anoint you. Remember in Genesis, where God takes and he breathes upon Adam. Let's see if I can find that. That's right here. I actually had a highlight from, from times past. Then the Lord God formed, verse 7, Genesis chapter 2, man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The chayim is from the tree of life. That's the fruit of the tree of life. Chayim, life is the fruit of the tree of life. The es hachayim, as we see in verse 9, and Jesus Christ is the tree of life. And, that, and he breathed in the nostrils of Adam. What did he do? He anointed the most holy place, the Kodesh Kodeshim. The renting of the veil also represents, you know, unveiling so you can see Christ in plain view. It also is the giving, the, in other words, he's able to open you as that temple and pour out his spirit within you. Now that was lost as a result of the sin that took place in the Garden of Eden. And oddly enough, we know that Jesus later, what does he do? But he, he breathed uh, on, on the disciples in John chapter 20, verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. That's in John 20, 20 chapter 20, verse 22. All right, let me, let, let me just take and uh, we'll, we'll jump over there real quick too, and I'll show you that one so you can make sure we have everything here for you to see uh, in this video. And by the way, we are very seriously thinking of putting this in book form. Uh, this teaching right here and because uh, I, I think it'd really be good for people to have that available uh, to them there you go right there and when he had said this he breathed on them and say said unto them receive you the holy ghost all right that is anointing the holy of holies because you are that temple of god all right so anyway daniel as I said, he was reading Jeremiah, and then, of course, let's 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 continue on down. Actually, I'll tell you what, he's reading Jeremiah. Let's look at what he's reading, though. I think we already did that already. We established that. 
Um, let's see here. Let me look at this here real quick. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at Jeremiah, because as we stated earlier in Daniel, before I continue on down, we want to establish this. Because Daniel, in chapter, chapter 9, verse 2, he was meditating on the books over the number of the years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish for the desolations of Jerusalem 70 years. Now, I think Daniel's trying to figure out the timeline. When is Jerusalem going to be desolate? So that's what he was doing, right? And if you go back and we look at where Daniel speak, or where Jeremiah spoke of this, um, the word of the Lord, excuse me, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, these three and 20 years, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you. Speaking uh, be times and often, but you have not hearkened. You have not listened, in other words. And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants to prophets, sending them uh, be times and often, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. Saying, return ye now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you, given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them or to worship them and provoke me not with the work of your hands and I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that you might Provoke me with the work of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words. Behold, I will send and take the families of the north, saith the Lord, and I will send unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will cause to cease from among them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Think about that. And it shall come to pass when the 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon that land all my words, which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah had prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make bondmen of them, and also I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the work of their own hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take this cup of wine of fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I sin you too to drink it, and they shall drink and reel to and fro, and like madmen, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup of the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. All right, now I'm just going to kind of stop right there. Notice so interesting as well, even right here in the green that I have highlighted for you, verse 10 and 11, I will cause to cease from among them the voice of mirth, in the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. The bride and the bridegroom is Christ and his bride. And this whole land shall be a desolation and a waste. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Now, most people look at that as, well, they went down in, to, to Babylon and under Nebuchadnezzar, they served 70 years down there. Well, it was actually more time they spent than 70 years down there. So we can't technically even use that as that illustration. And that's why Daniel was trying to understand what was the meaning of all this. 
How did that work out biblically? Well, look at what Jesus says over here in Matthew uh, chapter 23. He that shall swear by heaven, verse 22, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes and mint and, and eyes and cumin, and have omitted the weighter matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the, and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. And we know that Jesus continues on down. He continually um, abrades the Pharisees, the Sadducees of hypocrisy, etc. When you get to verse 30, he says, And say if we had been, actually verse 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barcaeus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Ver verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto you, how often I would have gathered the children, uh, your children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, and you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Let's look at that real quick in the Hebrew Matthew right here on your screen. Last part of that verse there, verse starting with verse 37. And upon Jerusalem who kills the prophets and removes those who are sent, how many times I wish to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you would not. Therefore you will leave your houses desolate. Truly I say to you, you will not see me henceforth until you will say, blessed is our Savior. Hmm. Fascinating, the difference in the verbiage right there. But the point is, when is that desolation to take place? When is the house to be desolate? When is there not to be another inhabitant whatsoever? Remember what Jesus says when he passes here, verse chapter 24, and it came to pass when Jesus went out from the temple, as he was going, his disciples drew near to show him the buildings of the temple. He said, you see all these, truly I say to you that all will be destroyed and there will not be left there one stone upon another. And he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite of the temple. And Peter and John and Andrew asked him secretly, when will all these things be? And what will be the sign when these matters will take place or when they will begin? And when will the end of the world and, uh, and your coming? But Jesus clearly in Matthew 24 lets you know the destruction of Jerusalem is the fulfillment of the desolate houses the desolation, the abomination of desolation. Wow, didn't know that one, did we? Let me, let me share with you from the Damascus document. And I wish I could show this to you, but unfortunately I can't. So let me get to the right place here. We're going to actually start. I'm reading from... Um, Charles Worth, the Dead Sea Scrolls, is their work on the translation of this, just so you know where we're at here. I'm on page 11. These books are very hard to come by, and I actually there's several volumes I'm still missing would love to find, but I've not been able to find them as of yet. Bear with me. This, like I said, is very difficult to read because I have to read in two different places here where they put the fragment together because there are ancient documents that the fragments were... Uh, in, in agreement with. So they put this all together for us. Um, at any rate, this is in, uh, this is from, let's switch fragment. Fragment 4Q266. 
and we read here, flesh and creature, which its beginning and which is its end. Before it befalls them, for they can neither come before or after their appointed times. And he established appointed times of favor for those that seek, ordained a period of wrath for a people that does not know him. Make sure I get it in the right place here. Oh, I read that backwards. Let me let me back up on this. You have to, like I say, you got to go very carefully on this because you can get it kind of mixed up here. It's hard for me to see with these glasses; they're not quite strong enough. Okay, for they can neither come before or after their appointed times. There's a blank spot. Ordained a period of wrath for a people that does not know Him. Okay, that does not know Him. And he established appointed times of favor for those that seek his ordinances and for those that walk in the perfect way. Now keep that in mind. Ordained a period of wrath for the people that does not know him. There's Daniel 70 weeks. Okay. For those that seek his ordinances and for those that walk in the perfect way, and he uncovered their eyes to hidden things, and for hidden things, and opened their ears, and they heard prof uh, profundities, and they discerned all that is to be before it comes upon them. And now, listen, all who know righteousness and discern the works of God, for he has a dispute with them, all flesh, and will make judgment against all who scoff him for their treachery in leaving him. He hid his face from Israel and from his sanctuary and gave them to the sword, but recalling the covenant with the first ones, he left a remnant for Israel and did not give them up for total destruction. That's Jeremiah. That's Jer they're speaking literally about Jeremiah's prophecy and how they weren't given up completely to, to destruction. So the prophecy about Jeremiah talking about them going down into to Nebuchadnezzar could not be that total desolation because the Damascus document actually shows they were not totally wiped out at that time. All right. I'll back it up again so we can see this. And gave them to the sword, but recalling the covenant with the first ones, he left a remnant for Israel, did not give them up for total destruction. And at the end of his wrath, there... 390 years after giving them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he turned his attention to them and he caused to grow out of Israel and Aaron a root planting to inherit his land and grow fat in goodness of his soil. And they discerned their iniquity and knew that they were guilty, and they were as blind as those who groped for a way. For twenty years, but God discerned their works, namely that they sought Him wholeheartedly, and He raised up for them the righteous teacher. 
So we read in the Damascus document, when they went to Babylon, that wasn't their total destruction. That wasn't the abomination of desolation that Daniel speaks of. Because they also knew that they came back and they knew the righteous teacher talking about Christ, that root of Jesse, as it also mentions. Okay? To guide them in the way of his heart, and he informed the latter generations that which uh, he did in the last generation among the congregation of traitors, who are those who depart from the way that is the time. Oh, wow. The traitors, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Right? There's your traitors. Okay, let's see here. Who are those who depart from the way that is the time? And remember, both Jeremiah and Daniel are dealing with the time, that time frame. 70 years, 70 weeks, right? The two different things that you're looking at of which it was written, as a straying cow, so did Israel stray. When the man of mockery arose, who sprinkled upon Israel waters of falsehood. There's the Antichrist of their day. And led them astray in a chaos without a way, bringing low the eternal heights. And departing from the paths of righteousness, moving the border marked out by the first ones, and their inheritance so as to apply to them the curses. Now Daniel 70 weeks is going to come in. The curses of his covenant, surrendering them up to the sword. Avenging the covenant's vengeance, for they sought smooth things and chose delusions and sought out loopholes and chose the fair neck and justified the evil man and condemned the righteousness, righteous man and caused the covenant to be broken and the statute to be violated. And they ganged up on those of righteous soul and all those who walk, their own souls and all those that walk perfectly, despised. And the anger of God was kindled against their congregation and they persecuted them with the sword and were joyful over dissension amidst the people. Get the right. Okay, and the anger of God was kindled against their congregation so as to lay waste to all their multitude and make their works as impurity before him. And now, listen to me, all who enter the covenant, and I will reveal to you your ear the way of the evil ones. The evil ones are the traitors. The traitors were the Pharisees and Sadducees. But he's talking about, they're talking, they, they, the Damascus document clearly defines the difference between the captivity of Israel going down, or the house of Judah going down to, the, uh, to Babylon, them coming back, starting over, the righteous teacher being raised up, and then as he pointed out that all the curses of the book that would be applied as a rejection, as a, because of their rejection of the righteous teacher, which is none other than Jesus Christ. So we continue on. Verse 3, this is fragment 2, column 2. He has set up before him. Uh, wait a minute. And for, excuse me, all the paths of the sinners, I will keep you apart. God loves knowledge, wisdom, and prudence. Line four, he has set up be before him. Craft and knowledge shall serve him, and manifold forgiveness is with him. So as to atone, 
Remember what Daniel said, right? Let, let, let's, let's, let's put this on Daniel here. Get down here so we can remember. See? To forgive iniquity, make an end of sin, finish the transgression, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision, right? For all those who repent of rebellious sin, but within him too are might and power and great wrath with fiery flames by the means of all the angels of the destruction. Leaving neither remnant nor survivors for those who depart from the way and despise the statute, for God did not choose them. There, now you're starting to see the destruction of 70 AD that's going to come. Leaving, I'll read that again, leaving neither remnant nor survivors for those who depart from the way and despise the statue, for God did not choose them. Primordially, and before they were established, he knew their works and despised their generation. Remember the prophecy of Esau and Jacob? And he hid his face from the land until the time of their complete destruction. And he knew the years they would stand. Seventy years. And the numbers and details of their times for all eternity, including what will come to be. I want to make sure, though, you get that one part there. That's in line number... Seven, I believe it is. Primordially, and before they were established, he knew their works and despised their generation. Because we're going we're gonna to jump over there and look at the Esau and Jacob issue there. Because that's where Esau really was. Esau were Edomites that had infiltrated in um, through the mingling of the bloodlines. Because you have to remember, Esau was the first one to mingle his bloodline. And his descendants came through Canaanites, Perizzites, you know, Ammonites and all those. And that's where, according to Ezra, the priests had mingled their seed with those Nephilim bloodlines, just like Esau had done. And they're the ones that come into power. And the Damascus document only proves that. And the numbers and the details of their times for all eternity, including what will come to be. Now, listen carefully. It gets very interesting. In line 10, we read, It happens in their respective periods during all the years of eternity, but during all those years, God raised up for himself those called, so as to leave over a remnant for the land and fill the face of the world. Wow, who are the ones that are called? That's that's your new Jerusalem. That's your, that's your new uh, Israel. That is the spiritual Israel. Let, let, let's look at that real quick with Paul over in Romans, right? That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Uh, right? For this is the word of promise at this time will I come. Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. And it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore has he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on him he will harden. And that's where we find out about this issue of Jacob and, of course, uh, or Esau. And that also comes from uh, Malachi, right? 
Malachi chapter one, I believe it is. But Esau I hated and made his mountains a desolation and gave his heritage to jackals of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are beaten down, but we will return. Watch that one. We will, we will return and build the waste places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down and they shall be called the border of wickedness and the people whom the Lord uh, uh, excreteth forever. And they did. The, 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 they had thrown out the true priests, the Zedekite priests that got thrown out by the Pharisees, or actually by, by, uh, by the Maccabees. They exalted, they overthrew the priesthood, threw out the true priesthood. And the Maccabees clearly had to be descendants of Esau. And then, of course, they go into exile, they go into Babylon, they come back. And as it says, whereas Edom saith, we are beaten down, but we will return and build the waste places. The waste places was what Nebuchadnezzar did to, to Jerusalem, to the temple. And the scripture says in the prophecy right here in Malachi, they shall build, but I will throw down and they shall be called the border of wickedness. Because they did, they came back, they built the second temple. And what was it for 70 years? The most evilest times of Israel's history was in the 70 years from the birth of Christ on forward. What do you know? What do you know how the prophecy can come together? Back to the Damascus document. Now we get here, line 11. Those calls so as to leave over a remnant for the land and fill the face of the world with their seed. That's what Paul was talking about, their seed. Isn't that, oh, that's so beautiful. How did, they, how did these Damascus document people know this? All about that seed there, the seed of Christ. So with their seed, and there's a blank spot, and he informed them through those anointed in his Holy Spirit and beholders of truth. There's your remnant. It's those that are filled with the Holy Ghost the day of Pentecost. Oh my gosh. Line 13, the details of their names, but those whom he hated, he caused to stray. And now, my sons, listen. Those that he hated, the Damascus document is letting you know that those that he hated, that the, the children of Esau, were the ones that were there. The Pharisees and Sadducees are nothing but Edomites. To me, and I will uncover your eyes to see and understand the works of God and choose that which he wants and despise that which he hates. To walk perfectly in all his ways and not to stray in the thoughts of guiltfulness, inclination, and licentious eyes. For perfectly in all stumbled because of them from the earliest times up until now thus walking after the wantonness of their hearts. Mighty warriors have stumbled. No, I'm sorry, I should have said that first. Mighty warriors have stumbled because of them from the earliest times up until now, thus walking in the wantonness of their own hearts. The watchers of heaven fail. They were held by it, for they did not keep God's ordinances and so to their sons who were as high as the cedars and as the mountains and whose corpses or excuse me, whose corpses were as the mountains as if they had not been for all flesh which was on dry land fell for they died and were as if they had not been for they had done their own will and had not kept the ordinances of their maker until his excuse me until his wrath was kindled against them, though it strayed the sons of Noah and their families, through it they were cut off. So not only did the Damascus document 
show you who Edom is, Esau, the Edomites. It also establishes for us the differences between the dispersion of, of Jeremiah's prophecy into Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, the return, how they how Israel would come back, they would rebuild, but the rebuilding, as, as Malachi points out, is Esau that rebuilds it. God says, I will tear it down. That's when they become a perpetual desolation. And we sit here and we see all of this written right here. And then he connects Esau and that remnant. As Jesus says, they were of the serpent, the reptilian race. And that's confirmed even in the Damascus document as well when he begins to show you how the, uh, the fallen angels, giving you that as a reference point as well. And then, so going back to Daniel 9, though, let's take a look at it as well. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make the end of sin, to forgive iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal the vision of the prophet, to anoint the most holy place. Remember, your, your soul being anointed with the Holy Ghost is anointing that holy place. Now, therefore, and discern that from the going forth the word to restore and to build Jerusalem until one anointed a prince, which is Christ, shall be seven weeks and for three score and two weeks, and shall be built again with a broad place and a moat, but in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off. And Christ was cut off. He was killed. But his end shall be with a flood. And to the end of the war, desolations are determined. That would be 70 A.D. And he shall make a firm covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. At the death of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice, not just the death of Jesus Christ, but the 70 A.D. mark is what brought an end to the sacrifice that they were offering in the temple. And the detestable thing shall be that which causeth appalment, and that until the ex extermination wholly determined to be poured out upon that which causeth appalment. Or um, let me give that to you in the King James Version so we can better uh, see that, because that, I know that sometimes the, they don't, I don't like the way they translate that in the Mamre version of that. It's desolate is what it really is. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. Consummation would be the end of it. That was 70 AD. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. The judgment was 70 AD. The judgment the destruction of the temple and the city, and they had been totally wiped out by the Romans. And by the way, that prince that shall come was Titus. That's your prince that shall come. He was the one that came and destroyed everything. And he wasn't an anointed prince either. If you notice that, that's one thing Daniel brings out. He was not an anointed prince. But he carried out the judgment of Almighty God. I hope this will help you in some way. I trust that it does. Uh, I know it's kind of long, and I apologize for that. If it is a blessing and you would like to support the work we do here at Israeli News Live, please do so. Uh, your help is what gives us the ability to, to do this full time. Uh, our mailing address, Dunoon Institute, or my name, Stephen Ben Noon. Uh, P.O. Box 156 Sunbright, Tennessee 37872, or you can click right there and donate online any any way you would like. And uh, definitely check out the, the videos on our website there. If you go to our channel there, you can, you can look at that. Um, you can also, I think, just click on the year there, and let's see how, I forget how that works there. But uh, there you go. You can see the different videos that we've done. This one here, no More Monkey Business uh, is really a very good video. It is on iConnect. It's also on our website. But if you go to iConnect and watch it, uh, you're actually able to um, see this video. It's the only video I've ever actually translated in multiple languages. 
Uh, and let me just, let me put it on trending. We'll see what's trending. I think that video was trending last I checked. Yeah, it still is actually in the top spot right now, two days ago. 14,000 views. But if you click on that and you, and you don't happen to, uh, this interview with, uh, you can see the name there. But we made sure we put it in every language we have available on our platform on iConnect. So if you click on Russian, Друзья, you play the video, you can listen to this in that language. Uh, it's really great when you got a video because you can see the person talking, but you hear them in the language that is your native language, if your native language is on there. Uh, we just had Portuguese added recently, so we trust that'll be a blessing for those because we had some people asking about Portuguese, and now we have Portuguese as well. Anyway, I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Thank you, and God bless you, and have a wonderful day.